let's get to Mark. Now, Mark, uh, you all know, or most of you know, because he was the president of our round table for uh, two years, uh, more than two years, probably. Uh, and he's a career uh, Air Force officer, retired uh, intelligence officer, spent a lot of time all over the world. Uh, Hawaii, Omaha, uh, where else were you, Mark? Turkey? Uh, Turkey, Fortnite. Germany, Italy, Korea. <laughs> he's, he's got a well, well-rounded uh, geographical profile. He was our president for two years, got a tremendous interest in the Civil War, and he is also uh, a real expert, I think, personally, I think, in, on what he's going to talk about tonight, the first Battle of Manassas, kind of his home battle. So tonight, we're going to hear from, uh, in our very first Zoom presentation, Mark Thompson, Colonel Mark Thompson, United States Air Force retired, first Battle of Manassas and the experience of war. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to address you all tonight and to provide you a little bit of insight on the first Battle of Manassas and also to provide you some insight on the personal effect that this conflict had on individuals who were engaged in it. Uh, I'm trying to do a couple of things tonight. And the first thing I think I need to do is get my face off the screen and share with you all. Here we are. And I am good. I am where I need to be now. So uh, I'm trying to do a couple of things with this presentation tonight. Uh, one of them is I want to provide you some intimate knowledge with regard to the first battle of Manassas. You know, for a lot of us Civil War buffs, we really get into it. We're aware that the First Battle of Manassas was fought. We're aware that it was a Confederate victory. We are aware that it was a rather humiliating defeat for the Union. And then we get on to the stuff that we're really interested in, whether it's the Battle of Chancellorsville, or it's the Battle of Gettysburg, or perhaps out west with Shiloh or some other engagement. And so we don't take an awful lot of time to look at this battle. And the reason I want to talk to you about it tonight is because it'll provide you a baseline. It provides you a baseline from which to evaluate future engagements that take place uh, during the Civil War. And you're going to see just how basic everybody starts off because this is the first go for a lot of these guys. And for even those folks who saw combat before, uh, they didn't see it in the capacity that they were serving at when they were involved in this engagement. What we're also going to do is give you the personal experience of some of those people who were engaged in the conflict. And their pictures are shown right on this slide as well, but we'll get on to them in just a bit. And I am trying to get my slides to advance. There we go. So this is kind of the way that we're going to attack this thing tonight. First of all, I want to give you some kind of familiarity with the people that we're talking about. These guys you know about, at least you know about later on in the conflict, but you may not know who they were, both professionally and personally, at the time that things kick off uh, at Manassas in 1861. We'll then give you a quick prelude to the battle just to go over how these guys and their units managed to get to the battlefield. And then we'll tackle the battle itself, which essentially is done in two pieces. Uh, there's a morning engagement, there's an intermission from 12 to two, and then there's an afternoon engagement. And then we'll talk about the aftermath. And we'll talk not just about the immediate aftermath of the battle, but we'll also talk about our protagonists and what they came away from uh, as they moved off the battlefield that evening of July 21st, 1861. So let's get on to the folks that we're going to talk about right now. The first guy I want to talk about is Pierre Gustave de Tom Beauregard, or at the time that this battle was fought, uh, he had dropped the Pierre piece of it. Uh, he did not need to sound any more foreign than he already did. Uh, you can see from the information that's on the slide that he came from Louisiana. He was a Creole. In fact, uh, Pierre Gustave Toutain Beauregard didn't even speak English until he was 12 years old and sent up north to start getting his formal education. But one thing is consistent about this individual throughout his entire life. He loved the military profession. He loved the military experience. And first and foremost, he loved 
Napoleon Bonaparte. You know, many have referred to him as the uh, Napoleon in gray. I'm sure that's how he wanted to be thought of himself. Uh, but the military was always part of what Gustave Tuton Beauregard wanted to be and wanted to do. When he went to West Point, he did extremely well. He was a very, very smart man, very, very knowledgeable. Obviously, he spoke French and, and English fluently, even helped tutor some of the other students in French when he was at the academy. But he didn't have a lot of friends there. He was, he was sort of a standoffish sort of guy and didn't really connect with anybody. But he graduated very high in his class. And as you can see, he went to the Corps of Engineers, which is usually what happened to people who uh, did well during their education. Went to war, served with Winfield Scott on his staff uh, during that engagement, and breveted twice for gallantry. So this is one of the individuals we know that experienced war personally before Manassas in 1861. And you might find it interesting that he ends up a superintendent of the United States Military Academy just before the outbreak of the war. That was a controversial appointment, and we can certainly talk about that in the question and answer session afterward. Uh, but it was just another ticknark for him, you know, another validation of a extremely competent, capable, effective military officer, not only in his own eyes, but in the eyes of others as well. He resigned his commission in 61, immediately promoted to the rank of Brigadier General of the Provisional Confederate Army. Probably his big, biggest point of noteworthiness, of course, uh, is his uh, presiding over the uh, shelling of Fort Sumter and the eventual defeat of the garrison there. And so he is a hero by the time that he arrives up here in Northern Virginia in 1861 to command, oddly enough, what he referred to as the Army of the Potomac. Another fellow that will be experienced the war we're here will be Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Now Jackson, again, like Beauregard, is a professional military officer, attended the academy at West Point, and also was combat experience, and had in a very, very noteworthy career of serving as a battery commander during the Mexican War. This is a guy who really seemed to shine when the battle initiated, but in the boring bureaucratic world of the military in between conflicts, uh, he did not particularly shine and, and really wasn't even a noteworthy individual. He was very bored with the military once the conflict in Mexico ended and by 1852 had gotten himself an instructor's position at the Virginia Military Institute where he taught what we would consider today physics. It was called experimental philosophy then and also was doing artillery instruction. A Union man, but very much dedicated to his state of Virginia. And so when Virginia secedes, uh, it's a foregone conclusion that Thomas Jonathan Jackson will go with it. He's appointed a colonel, and he's sent off to take over a bunch of rabble up there in Harper's Ferry that was gathering to protect a strategically important location. Uh, he will be superseded to command up in Harper's Ferry by Joseph Johnston, but Johnston will see to it that Beauregard is promoted to brigadier very quickly. He then takes command of what will become the first brigade of Johnston's army of the Shenandoah. Eccentric indeed, highly religious indeed as well. Here's an individual you may not recognize from his 1861 portrait, but he is experiencing his first large scale conflict uh, here at first Manassas as well considerably younger than the earlier individuals that we've talked about. He too is a professional military officer, uh, goes into the cavalry, a natural horseman, grew up in Southern Virginia where he had the opportunity to, to become familiar with horses in horse country, and uh, initially serves with the Mounted Dragoons but moves to the 1st Cavalry in 1857. He was with Lee as well, uh, when Lee went up to uh, take charge of the group that was attempting to recapture the garrison or the armory at Harper's Ferry and uh, was well known to the Lee family. In fact, his connections with the Lees go back actually to the time when he was at West Point and was good friends uh, with Fitzhugh Lee, Lee's nephew. He too is a born and bred and fanatical Virginian. He will resign his commission in 61 and he will be appointed to the colonelcy in command of the 1st Virginia Cavalry. 
uh, a unit that serves as a almost a full cavalry regiment at first Manassas, which is unusual. Most of the cavalry is all broken up, whether it's in the north or south at this point in the war. Again, he will be assigned to the Army of Shenandoah with Johnston and Jackson. Let's look at our Federals. A lot of people don't realize that William Tecumseh Sherman was at First Manassas. In fact, uh, Sherman is somewhat similar to people that we've talked about in that he initially started out with a military career, got bored, uh, uninspired by that experience and will resign his commission in 1853. It says he was breveted uh, to captain for meritorious service during the Mexican War, but as best most people can determine, that wasn't combat service. That was just staff level service. And so we're looking at a guy who really has experienced combat in the negative at this point, at first Manassas, had not done it before. You can see he tried a few jobs in between. He was serving as superintendent of the Louisiana State Seminary and Military Academy, which will eventually become LSU. And that's where he was when the war started. He throws his hat into the ring because even though he has a lot of their Southern friends, he is a dedicated union man, uh, immediately given a colonelcy in command of the 13th United States Infantry. That's regular troops. He thought he was going to go out to raise this regiment and be able to put them into training and then get them into war, but it's not what happened. Uh, he was selected for brigade level command and took command of the 3rd Brigade in um, Tyler's division, which will be part of the uh, Union force at First Manassas. Uh, an energetic, nervous, and a sort of mercurial kind of guy. This is a fellow everybody in the Fredericksburg area knows, probably because of the hard luck that he experienced at Fredericksburg. Uh, he was a contemporary, pretty much, of Stonewall Jackson. You can see he was born in the same year, graduated from the military academy one year after Jackson did. Went into the artillery just as Jackson did, and even managed to make it to Mexico City in 1848. But he got there after the shooting had stopped. It was garrison duty for him, and he'd moved from garrison duty in Mexico to the Southwest. He did get engaged in some combat uh, between 1849 and 53, uh, doing uh, actions against uh, the Plains Indians, uh, even managed to be wounded, slightly wounded. So he had experienced combat, at least in some form at that time. Uh, again, we have an individual who becomes dissatisfied with the peacetime military. Uh, he's an innovative sort of fellow and he develops uh, a unique breech loading rifle, uh, the uh, Burnside rifle, the Burnside carbine, uh, but he isn't much of a businessman and he ends up losing control of the company and literally going bankrupt. Uh, by the time that uh, it approaches the Civil War period, he's out there looking for a job. Luckily, he got to know a fellow by the name of George McClellan in Mexico uh, during the Mexican War, and McClellan is able to give him a job. So by the time the war starts in 61, he is an employee of the Illinois Central Railroad, of which uh, McClellan uh, is an executive of. He also stayed active in the militia organizations. He was very big in Rhode Island, where he lived. That's where he tried to get his carbine business established and was a colonel uh, in the Rhode Island militia, the infantry there. Uh, and because of that, when he uh, applies uh, to get involved in the war, he's given a colonelcy in Rhode Island right away and uh, is given command of Hunter's Brigade, David Hunter's Brigade, another or division, another division that will participate in the Manassas conflict. This guy, unlike Beauregard, never really desired to be a soldier at the beginning. And from his performance subsequent, to Manassas, maybe he shouldn't have been at all. And the last Union person that we're going to consider here is a very, very young George Armstrong Custer. Uh, Custer is born in 1839, so he makes the youngest person in this group of six that we're going to look at during this particular battle. Uh, another military academy graduate in 61, who is commissioned as a second lieutenant in the cavalry, uh, graduated last in his cab class. That's why he ends up in the cavalry, but he had a rather good reputation at West Point as a horseman anyway, 
Uh, he will be assigned uh, to Company G, 2nd United States Cavalry. That is Ennis Palmer's cavalry that is at Manassas. Uh, he has experienced zero combat. All right, let's get to the battle itself. Well, in the spring of 1861, and subsequent to the decision by the Commonwealth of Virginia to secede from the Union, uh, the problem for the Confederates becomes providing protection for this new state, a state that also contains the Confederate capital now. Strategically looking at things, there are two locations that it is important for the Confederates to keep an eye on. One is up north towards Harper's Ferry and Winchester, as you can see in the upper left corner of the slide. Uh, this position uh, in the lower valley provides a place to halt any incursion from Union troops coming in by way of Maryland and Pennsylvania. And by coming up the Shenandoah Valley, you can have access to the Manassas Gap Railroad, which will allow you to shift over to Manassas Junction and also get you uh, to a position where you can get in front of any force trying to advance from Washington on the Confederate capital. So that's an important place to watch. It's an important place to keep an eye on. And Johnston, Joseph Johnston sits up there along with Stonewall Jackson and Jeb Stewart and 12,000 other Confederates in May and June of 1861. Sitting on the opposite side of the coin from him is um, Patterson, Robert Patterson, with a scratch force of about 18,000 men. These are all militia guys. The vast majority are 90 days people. And so the problem for Patterson right away is, uh, if I'm gonna use these people in a fight, I've gotta do it soon because they'll go home in 90 days. And what complicates that for him is that they haven't received much training. Speaking of not receiving much training, if you look at McDowell over in Washington, over a force of 35,000, this is a group of folks that are equally poorly trained a group of folks that contain many, many, many 90-day volunteers. And so there's a time factor that's pressing on here. There's a time factor that's pressing on this group. If you look south of them, uh, down to Manassas Junction, you'll see Beauregard. And Beauregard's Army of the Potomac, as he named them, consisted of approximately 20,000 men. And their job was to keep control of Manassas Junction, a, a huge strategically important location because it's on the direct rail route that leads down ultimately to the South and ultimately to Richmond. And of course, it is connected to the Shenandoah Valley by way of the Manassas Gap Railroad. And the Confederates who are outnumbered at this point have to realize that if they're gonna have any chance against a force coming at either group, they need that railroad because troops are gonna to have to be moved to make sure they mass enough troops to deal with a threat, whether it comes from Patterson in the Northwest or from McDowell uh, in the Northeast. McDowell and Patterson definitely have more folks than the Confederates. However, McDowell and Patterson have their problems. If you take a look at the personalities of Irvin McDowell and Robert Patterson, uh, you can see the liabilities that are there. First of all, Urban McDowell is extremely intelligent. This is a man who has actually done some study in France uh, on behalf of the military when he was assigned there for a short period of time. He is intellectual. He's also extremely young. And he's not exactly the most shining person out there. He doesn't have that charismatic personality. He has been on the staff of the Union Army Commanding General Winfield Scott for some time. Scott loves this guy. This is his go-to guy. This is the guy who gets things done for him, and Scott loves him. Trouble is, Scott also loves Robert Patterson. Robert Patterson and Winfield Scott go back a long way, all the way back to the Mexican War, where they served together, and it was based upon the experience during that war that Scott begins to form or forms his opinion of of Patterson. And he looks at Patterson as a very dedicated, dependable individual who'll do what he's told to do. Trouble is, by this point in time, Patterson is a much older person. He's been out of the army for some time. 
and has developed a level of caution. Now McDowell is gonna end up commanding the Army of the Northeast, which is the army located up in Washington. And he's gonna get that position, not because Winfield Scott wants him to have that position, but because he has a very close relationship with the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, who used to be the governor of Ohio. And our friend McDowell is from Ohio as well. And Chase serves as a real patron. And he's able to get the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, to support his desire to put this Ohio guy, McDowell, in a key position. And so the command is offered to him, much to the chagrin of Winfield Scott. Scott even tells McDowell that it might not be a bad idea for him to turn down this command because again, he doesn't have the seniority to take it over. Uh, but McDowell, out of a sense of duty says, look, if it was given to me, then I am obligated to take this command. I cannot turn away from it. But regardless of their own personality problems, they have other problems as well. The soldiers that they command, and we've talked about that just a moment ago, the fact that these are militia troops, the fact that they're under a 90 day deadline for the most part. So something's gotta be done with these guys and it's gotta be done fast. Well, Union troops are continuing to congregate in Washington. And unfortunately, they're spending most of their time in Washington having a good time and carousing around. Uh, if discipline is tried uh, on them, if, they're, if their officers try to put them under some level of discipline, uh, they get a lot of trouble because these are militia guys by the, for the most part. These 35,000 guys. And after Virginia secedes from the Union, uh, many of them are sent across the river. They're sent across the river to Arlington and they're sent across the river to Alexandria and to occupy those pieces of the Commonwealth of Virginia. But public clamor, congressional clamor, and to some degree, the soldiers clamor themselves kind of revolves around this idea of we need to get into this thing. We need to get moving. We need to not just be sitting around and the Lincoln government has to react to the pressure that's being placed upon them. Of course, McDowell says that these guys are 90 volunteers, they're not ready for this job. And at a cabinet meeting on June 29, 1861, Lincoln utters those famous comments, you are all green alike, I need something to happen and I need to happen now, get me a campaign plan. So the campaign plan is developed. First of all, McDowell has got to get himself to Manassas. He decides the best way for that to happen is for him to advance along uh, three different tracks, not to put all the troops on the same road. Now, the Confederates are not all located in Manassas. The vast majority of them are. You can look at Cock and you can look at Jones and Longstreet down on the banks of Bull Run, but you can also see that Bonham and Early's brigades have been pushed out pushed out to Fairfax and to Fairfax Station. These are advanced elements that are out there, sent out there by Beauregard to make contact with the enemy when they advance. And on the 16th of July, the enemy will begin advancing. Tyler's division will advance up from the north out of Arlington towards Vienna. They'll arrive in Vienna on the 16th of July. At the same time, Hunter's people, David Hunter's division will be put on the road along with Dixon Miles Division, another division in the Army of the Northeast. They're essentially going to be moving up the Little River Turnpike towards Confederate troop concentrations at Fairfax Courthouse. Uh, once they get to the, uh, a point near Annandale, uh, Miles is gonna branch off to the south on Old Braddock Road uh, and move uh, towards the Confederates from the south. And the final group advancing will be Heinzelman's Division coming up the Old Fairfax Road advancing towards Early's folks sitting down at Fairfax Station. So what you have is a pretty smart advance by McDowell here. These troops are split up on multiple roads so they don't back each other up. And he's bringing forces in from the north and he's bringing forces in the south to put pressure there, as well as forces coming in uh, directly from the east against Fairfax Courthouse and Fairfax Station. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, our friend Bonham will pull out and move back across Bull Run. 
And ultimately early, we'll do the same, going down to a spot along Bull Run called uh, Union Mills Ford and sit at that location. Meanwhile, the Army of the Northeast will continue to move forward. If you look up in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you're going to see Centerville Circle. And that's where the vast majority of the Army of the, of the Army of Northeast is located uh, on uh, the 17th of July. Now, on the 18th of July, authorization is going to be given by Daniel Tyler, a division commander with McDowell's force, uh, to advance on to advance on Blackburn's Ford, to advance on Bull Run. Now, they know there are Confederates down there. At least they have a pretty good idea there are Confederates down there. What they don't know is how many Confederates are actually located down there. What uh, Tyler is going to do is allow uh, Israel Richardson's brigade to move forward. And excuse me, it is Richardson's job to make direct contact with whatever Confederate force is there, but not to force the issue. Absolutely not to force the issue. Trouble is, Richardson, who is a combat veteran from the Mexican War, uh, gets his dander up when he runs into contact with Longstreet's brigade uh, at uh, Blackburn's Ford, which is, oh, by the way, where Virginia 28 crosses Bull Run uh, at this very day. Um, you, can, you can be in close proximity to that by just driving along Route 28 uh, these days. Um, the bottom line here is that Richardson gets himself in pretty deeply and is unable really to extricate himself. Uh, by the time that McDowell hears about this, and gets down to Blackburn's Ford himself, he is furious. He is not necessarily furious with Richardson, which is someone too far below his pay grade. He's furious with Tyler because Tyler's his division commander. Tyler let him get out of control. Now we've got issues between Tyler and McDowell as well because Tyler is much older, he's regular army and he resents the hell out of this young, intelligent, super smart whippersnapper, McDowell, who's running things. Bad blood starts between Tyler and McDowell here at Blackburn's Ford on the, on the 18th, and it's gonna have impacts on the battle that comes later. Now, as we move closer and closer to Bull Run, both of these commanders, Urban McDowell, commanding the Army of the Northeast, and PGT Beauregard commanding the Army of the Potomac have to decide how to confront the opposition. And in true Napoleonic style, both generals want to launch an offensive. McDowell wants to launch an offensive initially against Beauregard's right flank. However, in his advance towards Bull Run, he begins to see that the topography, the terrain, and the roads will simply not support an advance along that route. And so he reluctantly decides that he's going to have to go against Beauregard's left or those Confederate forces that are located up near the Warrington Turnpike where the Stone Bridge is located. That's his plan. Beauregard, ironically enough, decides that he wants to go against McDowell's left, uh, the very terrain across which McDowell himself did not want to advance. Beauregard's plans are very much classic Napoleonic military plans. He plans to use those Confederates that are sitting down there on Bull Run proper up near the Stone Bridge, or excuse me, not the Stone Bridge, but Blackburn's Ford to keep McDowell occupied while he takes a flanking force around to the right and places Confederate forces between McDowell's army and his base in Washington. Ironically enough, both generals plan to launch these, these attacks on the 21st of July. Beauregard wants to move early, excuse me, McDowell wants to move early at 2.30 in the morn, but Beauregard is looking at a 7.30 attack or a seven o'clock attack. Now let's look a little bit at these forces before we actually get into the battle. And what you're looking at here is a depiction of the forces that are under McDowell, the 35,000 forces under McDowell. And what I've shown you on the schematic 
are the actual units that are going to be engaged during the first battle of Manassas. Those are, of course, Tyler's division, Hunter's division, and Heinzelman's division. Uh, we also have cavalry under Ennis Palmer. These are United States cavalry by and large, and uh, a small force, but pretty well split up between the various brigades uh, that are underneath uh, General McDowell. Now you might ask yourself, what the heck is happening with Miles Division and Runyon's Division, which is an awful lot of people to hold out of the fight and not engaged. Well, Miles Division is going to be given the job uh, during the attack of keeping the Confederates pinned down uh, on their center and on their right flank. That's what that Miles Division is gonna be engaged in. And Runyon's Division, which is made up of troops that are probably more poorly trained than anyone else, are going to be strung out along the roads leading back to Washington to maintain security on the line of advance. So we see here that our friend McDowell is not going into this fight with a full 35,000, a little over 26,000. And here's the way he sees it. You can see, see Tyler's division depicted on here. They're located on what's US 29 today, the old Warrington Turnpike. And where you see Evans Confederate Brigade here, that's where the Stone Bridge is located at. Tyler is gonna move forward according to this game plan with, with Schenick, with Keyes, and Sherman's brigades. Now Richardson belongs to Tyler too, but Tyler has farmed Richardson out to uh, General Miles Division. And Richardson's people are gonna be with that force of Federals that are designed to keep the Confederates uh, to the Union left occupied. Those troops under Longstreet and Jones and Bonham, they're gonna keep them busy. And they'll even detach one brigade uh, from Miles Division, Davies Brigade, to come down there and assist uh, Richardson. In the meantime, Hunter and Heinzelman will follow Tyler, but just about where you see the box that indicates Tyler's division on the map, there's a road that heads up to the north. This road was scouted by John Barnard uh, a day or two before the actual campaign or the battle is initiated, and it wasn't scouted out the whole distance, however. So the general feeling was that it was a good enough road for two full divisions approximately 13,000 men to advance along and cross Bull Run to the north. First at Sudley Ford, then at Sudley Springs Ford over Catharpin Run, and to come down behind the Confederate left where you see Evans Box. And here you see Davies and Richardson, and their job is simply, as I said earlier, to stay on the north side of Bull Run and to keep Longstreet, Bonham, Jones, and you'll busy. The problem is there are other people here now, people that, my, that, that McDowell is not aware of. Jackson's Brigade, B's Brigade, Bartow's Brigade, and Stewart's 1st Virginia Cavalry. Now these are all people that belong to Johnston's Army of the Shenandoah. And it, it was important, at least for the Federals, in terms of getting this plan to work, to keep those folks pinned over there in the Shenandoah Valley and not be able to be shipped east to augment Beauregard. But clearly they have by the 21st. And if you wanna pull our map back a little bit and look at the overall theater of operations, I ask you to take a look up into that corner where Johnson and Patterson are located. Because what is gonna happen up there is Patterson's gonna make some fleeting efforts to engage in combat against Johnston's force. And this is primarily against Confederate cavalry. He's not moving that large force of 18,000 because quite frankly, he doesn't think out they're up to the job. And quite frankly, no one has specifically told him that he needs to do this. In fact, he's been told that he needs to avoid a major disaster. So he's being very, very cautious. Now, on the 17th, of July, word comes down to Johnston by way of telegraph information from Richmond telling him he needs to go down and supplement Beauregard 
because McDowell is on the march. So Stewart will screen the departure of Johnston's forts as they head south. Their destination is Piedmont Station. Why Piedmont Station? Because they can get on the train there and they can move. They can move all the way to Manassas Junction. And in fact, that force is going to use the next couple of days to do that. It's one train at a time. They carry them down, the train goes back and picks up more and off they go to transport more. The very last brigade from the Army of the Shenandoah is not gonna get on this battlefield until the afternoon of the 21st. But what's happening is that Johnston is able to give Patterson the slip. And because Patterson is not pressing Johnston effectively, Johnston is able to do that. And so literally 10 to 12,000 Confederates are able to move uh, to Manassas. Now let's look at that force. This is what Johnston brings to the fight. Interestingly enough, you don't see divisions here because the Confederate Congress hadn't authorized them. So you have brigades and there's Jackson's brigade, Bartow's B's and LZ's brigade. Uh, the Confederate cavalry, that's 334 folks that make up primarily the first Virginia. So basically Joseph Johnston comes into this fight bringing everything he's got essentially 10,000 effectives. This is what Beauregard has at the same time. And remember, we've seen Bonham, and we've seen Cock, we've seen Early and Evans. Those brigades are all deployed along uh, Bull Run. Uh, those are the brigades that are going to be used in this fight. Uh, the brigades that you see listed up on the right-hand side of the slide Ewell, Jones, Holmes, and Longstreet aren't. Now these are units that were primarily designed for attack. Remember, Beauregard wanted to launch an attack on the 21st himself. So he's put most of his weight over on that side of the force. And it's gonna require some fancy footwork to get assets back over on the left side of his line to be able to deal with the threat that is going to be posed by the Federals. So here we look at the big picture again. Now I bring your attention down to the right lower part of the screen where you see uh, Longstreet, Bonham, and Jones. I'm gonna outline for you exactly what Beauregard was trying to do. Beauregard's plan on this day, kick this attack off, was to use Longstreet and Bonham to provide direct pressure on the Federals that are located on the other side of Bull Run. Keep them busy keep them from shifting assets uh, into another location. In the meantime, he would be able to use Ewell, which you see in the lower right-hand corner, Holmes, who came up from Fredericksburg, and D.R. Jones, Jones to do a flanking maneuver that will put them behind the Federals and separate Richardson from Centerville, and also separate the vast majority of the Federals who are up in the Centerville area now, well west of there, uh, from uh, a, a way of getting getting back to Washington. Uh, the trouble with this battle plan is it doesn't get executed. Why doesn't it get executed? Primarily because Beauregard doesn't give them a particular jump off time to start. He just tells them that he will tell them when they execute. In fact, Ewell never gets orders to advance to begin with. And so this attack really comes off the hinges at the very beginning of the day. Longstreet's gonna get across Blackburn Ford. D.R. Jones is gonna get across McLean's Ford. Ewell is not gonna get across, and, and that, that attack is gonna fall apart, especially at the time that the federal attack begins to take off. So let's move into the morning of the 21st here. This is a map you're familiar with already. And here's the game plan, 2.30 in the morning, everybody gets roused in the vicinity of Centerville where you see Blinker and Tyler begins to move his division forward. They have a hell of a time getting across Cub Run. The bridge is old, it's dilapidated, and uh, the force is carrying a 30 pound Parrot gun, massively heavy. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of fear that the bridge is gonna collapse with this Parrot gun going forward and it really delays the advance. And you can see from the scale on this map, we're talking no more than two and a half miles to get to the stone bridge, but it takes 
Tyler literally until six in the morning to get his forces down opposite the Stone Bridge because they move so slow. And there's one massive problem with this. The massive problem is the flanking force, which has to go an even farther distance, almost 10 miles to get behind Evans, uh, is behind Tyler. So as, as Tyler is wringing his hands at Cub Run and moving at the speed of a glacier down the Warrington Turnpike towards a stone bridge, Hunter and Heiselman are sitting there twiddling their thumbs, waiting to get going. A proper way to advance would have been to put Hunter and Heiselman in front. They had the longer distance to go. Again, we have novices in this fight. Let's face it, McDowell had never controlled more than eight people in a marching formation in his life. And now he's trying to execute this grand strategy. Be that as it may, it's, it's not even just a question of going 10 miles and being delayed. The trail is, is atrocious. It is not a, a, a road that is capable of putting Hunter and Heinzelman's division down it in an effective and quick manner. In addition to that, their guide actually takes them farther away at one point from Sudley Ford, simply because they're afraid that the Confederates may see them. What this all translates out into, folks, is that by the time that Tyler is in position at the Stone Bridge, it's about six in the morning. He fires that big 30 pound parrot gun, which they can hear all the way to Sudley Springs. That's the signal for Hunter and Heitzelman to make their crossing and to complete the flanking operation. Trouble is at six o'clock, Hunter and Heitzelman are nowhere near Sudley Springs. They're nowhere near Sudley Ford. They're not gonna be there till nine o'clock in the morning, a full three hours later. Now, as they're advancing all the way down south, uh, down near Blackburn's Ford, uh, there are signal stations. They, they literally stretch from, from the location very, very close to Union Mills that you see on your slide, all the way up to where Evans is located up along the Warrington Turnpike. And this is the famous story that you all heard about. E.P. Alexander has established these stations and E.P. Alexander is able to see the advance of Hunter and Heinzelman's force uh, looking through his spyglass and then begins to transmit the information down the line so that it eventually reaches Evans. And Evans is told, look to your left, you're being flanked. Evans, who has, doesn't even have a full brigade. He has like 1,100 guys. The first, the first Louisiana Special Battalion and the fourth South Carolina. These guys are literally holding off thousands of people in Hunter's division who aren't pushing their way across the Stone Bridge because they've been told that's not what they're there to do. They're there to keep the Confederate Brigade on the left flank busy. Now, something else that may be holding our friend Tyler back is rumors that the Stone Bridge has been mined. And so there's not a lot of willingness to cross there. After three hours, when the message, actually it's been more like about two hours, when the message is transmitted to Evans that he's about to be flanked, he's been sitting here engaged with Tyler for two hours. And these people seem like they're not really interested in crossing Bull Run. And now he's been told they're being flanked. So he makes the gutsy decision. No one's telling him to do this. A lot of brigadier initiative here. He makes the gutsy decision to cross over Matthews Hill and move towards the Matthews house here with about 900 men out of an 1,100 man force. And to keep the 400 guys back there, 300 guys back there at the Stone Bridge holding uh, the, the Federals back. In the meantime, not only does Evans know that he's being flanked, but Johnston and Beauregard, who are located at Mitchell's Ford. If you look on the slide uh, and you see Bonham's brigade, look north of there and you'll see Mitchell's Ford. They're sitting uh, south of Mitchell's Ford here and they're privy to the same information. You're about to be flanked. They're also hearing a hell of a fight going on over at the Stone Bridge. And Johnston is, is concerned. He doesn't think he has enough folks on the left flank to take care of the left flank. 
So he's going to pull B and he's going to pull Bartow's brigades, which are circled, and he's going to send them over towards Cock and Evans to provide them support if necessary. Now, ultimately, he's going to send Jackson too. Now, this is all while Beauregard still wants to launch this big attack on the right flank, which, as time goes on, will not happen. So, nine o'clock, the Federals make it to Sudley Springs. By about 10 o'clock, the advance elements of Hunter's division, which are Ambrose Burnside's brigade, move down Sudley Manassas Road towards the stone house, you can see on our slide here, and they make contact with the 900 people that Evans has put across the path. Now, Burnside makes initial contact with only one regiment, that is the second Rhode Island. And uh, in addition to that, there are six J James guns, James rifled guns that belong to Reynolds Rhode Island Brigade that are placed on Burnside's right. And these are the folks that make initial contact with Evans. Uh, Evans is doing everything he can to keep this force slowed down, realizing he doesn't have a lot of people. He even authorizes Robert O. Wheat and the 1st Louisiana Battalion to charge Burnside's second Rhode Island but they get their tails whacked and skedaddle literally back across uh, the Manassas Sudley Road over towards where you see the Dogan House on the far left of the slide. Um, what complicates factors here also is that the division commander, in this case, um, David Hunter, he is located up front with Burnside. He's not back where a division commander needs to be. He's up on the front line and guess what? He gets shot and he gets taken out of the line. And as he's carried back, he tells Burnside, I turn it over all to you. And, and away he goes. Now, Burnside is able to bring more forces to extend that line I'm showing you, so that ultimately you're gonna have the first Rhode Island, the 71st uh, New York, as well as the second New Hampshire uh, located uh, in addition to our friends with the uh, second Rhode Island. Evans knows he can't handle this. Lucky for him, he begins to see Bartow and B show up back near Henry House Hill at about 11 o'clock. And so he literally goes back to those guys and tells General B, who's in charge of both forces, I need you people up here. Now B argues with him and says, I think you should fall back here. It's a better position. But through strength of will, Evans prevails. And so, first, starting with the 4th Alabama, and then the 2nd Mississippi, elements of the 11th Mississippi, um, B's forces move forward, and ultimately Bartow will move forward with the 7th and the 8th Georgia, extending the line. So you can see on the slide here, the battle lines are being extended, and Evans is doing his job. Now, even with the addition of B and Bartow, we're talking a force now of probably about 3,000 guys. Now, Burnside has got, with all of his brigade level assets up there, maybe a couple thousand plus, many more thousand are sitting back behind him on the road. Now, let's talk about a personal experience with battle. Well, here's Burnside's first one. And uh, boy, talk about taking on the job under fire. Uh, that's exactly what happens. As you can see from the comments here, uh, command is turned over to him. What command, that becomes a question. Is it a command of the line or is it command of the division? If it's command of the division, then Hunter has violated protocol because the other brigade commander in Hunter's division, Andrew Porter, outranks Burnside. So there's, there's confusion. It takes Burnside a little while to get his troops on line. As the Confederates continue to extend their line to the right, as I showed you in the last slide, Burnside has been characterized as being hysterically excited and literally rides over to Porter, who is the division commander now that our friend Hunter is out of the game and says he needs the regulars. I need the regulars to be able to hold the line over here. And the regulars are gonna be sent to augment the line. And Burnside has been doing all the fighting with his own single brigade up to this particular point in time. Um, by the time more forces arrive, by the time Porter's people are in position and Heinzelman's division comes up, Burnside's people are out of gas. They don't have any more gun ammunition, so they pull out and replenish. 
but by this point in time, Burnside is emotionally exhausted. In the slide, you see the battle line that we have been discussing with Burnside Porter on his right and more coming up behind them. That whole flanking force represents over 13,000 people against a force of no more than 3,000 on the hill. At this point, Jackson, who you see in the lower right-hand corner, is sent to go over and provide support. And so in addition to our friends B and Bartow, Jackson, now located near Portici, the Lewis House about center slide, is getting close to being able to provide assistance. And that blue circle that I just circled is our friend William Tecumseh Sherman. Now Sherman has been sitting on the other side of Bull Run this whole time with uh, Tyler uh, not pushing the issue. He is told though by Tyler by about 11 o'clock in the morning that he needs to find a way over the Ford because McDowell sent word to Tyler, I want you over here. Things are getting out of control and McDowell is with the flanking column force. Fortunately for our friend Sherman, he knows the, just the spot to ford because Robert O. Wheat, commander of the 1st Louisiana Special Battalion, had came down earlier in the day, ridden across Bull Run, and shouted obscenities at the Federals on the other side of the line. Those were Sherman's folks. And so when obscenities were shouted at them uh, and the folks rode back across the stream, uh, Sherman would know exactly where to go. And, and that's what he does. He manages to force the issue at Farm Ford. He manages to get his entire brigade across with the exception of the artillery because the hill is far too steep. And Sherman, once he gets on the other side of Bull Run, he doesn't wait for orders from Tyler. He goes to the sound of the shooting, which is all happening over on Matthews Hill. Here's our line. You see Burnside, you see Porter engaged. Now, by the way, additional artillery has been brought up by the Federals. Battery D, 5th U.S. under Griffin. Battery I, 1st U.S under Ricketts. And it's getting to be too much for Evans, B, and Bartow to handle, but they're holding on. But when Sherman comes up, he becomes a part of this line too. And so at adding the additional 2,100 people in Sherman's brigade, uh, Evans and B can't hold out anymore. Evans, B, and Bartow begin to pull back across the Warrenton Turnpike towards Henry House Hill. Now, Where's the Federal Cavalry in all of this? Who knows? Well, you know, that's Palmer's Cavalry. Remember, those are United States Cavalrymen. They're sitting on the right flank and not really being used the way Cavalry should be used, but nobody knows how to use them at this point in the war anyway. And serving in the second United States Cavalry is our friend George Armstrong Custer. And Custer is sitting over there with Palmer's unit. Now he's been up for 48 hours straight. He literally got into Washington just in time to uh, go to headquarters, meet Winfield Scott, literally get the approval to carry orders to McDowell uh, in the early morning hours. This is a, on the 21st, which he does, and then joins his unit, literally just as things begin to kick off with the advance. And so Custer moves forward uh, with his unit, and they move to the flank. Um, sitting over there in the flank, their job is to protect Griffin's artillery battery, Battery D-50 US. Um, Custer is very nervous. He's never been in combat before. And he is now literally leading men. And I'm going to read you just a quick quote out of the book here. This is Custer's memoirs of the, of the, of the Civil War. And he said, when it is remembered that but three days before I had quitted West Point as a schoolboy and yet had never ridden anything more dangerous or terrible than a three-foot hurdle or tried my saber upon anything more animated or combative, than a leather head stuffed with tan bark, it may be imagined that my mind was more or less given to anxious thoughts as we ascended the slope of the hill in front of us. At the same time, I realized that I was in front of a company of old and experienced soldiers, all of whom would have their eye upon the new lieutenant to see how he comported himself under fire. Custer was under a lot of pressure. Uh, he will literally move forward with his platoon uh, up to the top of Dogan's Ridge to provide protection for those guns of Griffin's, but no one ever ends up charging Griffin's guns, and so Custer's unit is withdrawn. And one point I want to make an observation about here, too. 
the cavalry and Custer are really not engaged in anything else related to this battle until we get to the withdrawal, the retreat. Um, it gives him an opportunity to literally sit in the top of Dolan's Ridge the entire morning and afternoon and from a strategic level, watch this whole engagement. So here's our recap of the morning, late start, but despite the fact that there's a late start, McDowell is getting the job done. The Confederates have been pushed off of Matthews Hill back to uh, Henry Hill. They are completely disorganized. Um, a positive note for the Confederates is that they've been able to delay the advance. It wasn't just a quick trip uh, down to the junction of Sudley Road and the uh, Warrington Turnpike. Uh, they had to fight their way to get there. And at about 11.30, there's a lull. And McDowell will not do anything for the next two hours. Now, many people have said, well, that's because he was trying to get his units back organized and reestablished replenish ammunition stocks. Uh, there's a certain amount of exhaustion that comes into play, not only the federal troops, but McDowell himself, who's been running on sleep fumes for the last couple, three days. But that brings us to the afternoon. Now, by the time the afternoon begins, if you look at the uh, lower right-hand portion of the slide, you'll see Evans B. Bartow. These units are not in any kind of shape to do any fighting at this point. These guys are shot up. Many of them have lost their officers, and they're just kind of wandering around there aimlessly. The good news for them is that two units have arrived. One of the units is Hampton's Legion, which just arrived that morning and came up from Manassas Junction. And the other one is Stonewall Jackson's brigade. Now, while McDowell is trying to figure out what he's going to do, Porter's brigade, which is now under William Averill, since Porter has moved up to division command, um, Averill can't stand it. He's got to get something going here. We just can't be sitting around here doing nothing, looking at all these people up on uh, up on the uh, on the area behind Robinson House, wandering aimlessly. And so, first with the 27th New York, then with the 8th and the 14th New York, there will be movement down from Dogan's Ridge across Buck Hill, past the Stone House. And because the Confederates have artillery, you see Imboden's guns down there near the Henry House. These came up uh, with B and Bartow earlier in the day and have been providing support to the Confederates, literally helping them throughout the whole process. Um, the 27th, 8th, and 14th don't attack directly up the hill. They try to get around the flank. Trouble is the Hampton Legion is in place and they stop them. And so these three attacks, one regiment at a time, go absolutely nowhere. They're not authorized by McDowell. This is initiated by Averill, thinking that something needs to be done. Now, remember when Sherman crossed for Farm Ford? Well, he wasn't the only brigade there. Uh, Key's brigade was also located there. And after Sherman moves up to head towards Matthews Hill, Key's and our friend Tyler come across Bull Run. And on their own volition, they move forward. They cross the turnpike and they see Confederate forces up there and they configure themselves. Uh, literally, Keyes and Tyler configure these guys for attack. They have four brigade or four regiments they can use. Who knows the reason? They only put two forward. The second Maine and the third Connecticut. They launch attacks against the Hampton Legion in the fifth Virginia and those two units along with some artillery support now brought up by Jackson push those two units back. The first and second Connecticut are never brought into the game. And our friend Tyler never bothers to discuss his moves in any way, shape, or form with McDowell, who he can't stand anyway. And so this dysfunctionalism between uh, Tyler and McDowell uh, permeates into a problem on the battlefield. McDowell has taken his time, and now he figures, I have to get past this junction. I've pounded these Confederates with artillery for hours. And despite all of that pounding, they haven't disappeared completely. And his decision is, in the spirit of Napoleon, I will move batteries on to Henry House Hill directly, and I will force those Confederates off the hill with a concentrated artillery fire. And I'll probably bring up maybe some infantry to support them, but I can put the guns up there first, because that's how Napoleon did it years before. 
What he doesn't really realize is that Jackson's brigade is sitting on Henry Hill too in the tree line below the military crest and are invisible. And that this group of soldiers is gonna cause a problem for this artillery. So here on this slide, you could see Jackson's brigade, all of the units of Jackson's brigade, they are invisible to the Federals at this point. Imboden's guns have been pulled back. Uh, Imboden's out of ammunition. Jackson actually keeps him from leaving the field and tells him to put his guns in front of his brigade. Uh, he sends a couple other batteries up to stand with him and he will eventually bring more units up there, more artillery up there that are being sent by Johnson and Beauregard uh, to provide assistance. You know, something I haven't mentioned here either is that at this point in time, uh, Beauregard and uh, Johnston are on the field. So here's Jackson, here's Jackson, and he's up on the military crest. He is not seen by anyone. And because he is an old veteran when it comes to fighting, because he has spent those moments under fire in Mexico, uh, he handles his brigade very calmly, very effectively. Look at those comments. Literally, these are from his own troops. Moved as calmly as a farmer about his farm. One of his former cadets at VMI said that he saw the warrior and forgot the eccentric man at that point. Jackson is riding the line like a calm farmer surveying his fields, literally telling his men, steady man, steady man, all is well. And they sit there under fire. And these are militia troops who aren't experienced for almost three hours, enduring 24 casualties from federal artillery. In fact, B, whose troops are a complete wreck at this point, when he sees Jackson, uh, goes up to Jackson and says, they're driving us, Jackson, and makes his famous statement that we'll give him the bayonet. And of course, B goes back and tries to rally his men by making the comment that Jackson stands like a stone wall. Beauregard and Johnston are also on the field at 1230. Um, this is about the time that uh, uh, we are in the lull as far as McDowell is concerned. And uh, they both provide tremendous amount of stability to troops that have been completely demoralized. Literally, Johnston and Beauregard working with the remnants of B. Bartow and Evans' brigade uh, get these guys back together, literally by just providing charisma, speeches, inspiring them. I mean, this is, this is what Beauregard does best. And uh, interestingly enough, at this point, Beauregard is able to dock Johnson off the field. He says, we both don't know, need to be here right now. We see how things are beginning to pan out. I think you need to go back as senior commander to Portici to the Lewis House in the rear and continue to make sure four troops are forwarded from our right flank, which are no longer being used in an attack, to come over here to provide assistance. I will volunteer to remain here on Henry Hill and direct operations. And of course, Johnston leaves and this is, just gives Beauregard exactly what he wants. So it's two o'clock now and it's time to get things moving again. Now that the Confederates have been able to get themselves more reinforcements, now that the Confederates have been able to get additional artillery support. And from Dogan Ridge, two batteries, Griffin's five gun battery and Ricketts six gun battery, mostly 10 pound rifle pieces, but there are a couple of 12 pound howitzers with Griffin. They get moved in advance. Let me tell you, the Griffin and Ricketts did not want to go forward and place these guns with absolutely no support. Uh, they thought it was folly. That may, may have been done during Napoleon's era when muskets didn't have a particularly good range. It sure ain't the way to do it now. And the other problem for them is they were pounding the crap out of the Confederates over there on Henry Hill because they had the rifled gun range to do it. Confederate artillery sitting on Henry Hill could have reached them. But once these batteries have been moved to Henry Hill, now they're within range, not only of Confederate artillery, but they're in range of Confederate infantry. Now, Chief of Artillery made it his point, the Union Chief of Artillery made it his point uh, uh, to, uh, to bring uh, additional assets, infantry assets to protect the guns. And that's who you see circled here. So you see from top to bottom the 38th New York, the 14th New York, the Marine Corps Battalion, 
and also the 11th New York and the 1st Minnesota. Now these guys have been brought up to provide support to these guns, to make sure these guns are protected and they are not stormed by the Confederates. That's, that's their whole purpose of being there. I will tell you as a soldier from a unity of command standpoint, this is a mess as far as an arrangement is concerned. Minnesota, the first Minnesota belongs to, belongs to uh, Franklin's brigade of Heinzelman's division. The 11th New York, it belongs to Orlando Wilcox's brigade of Heinzelman's division. The Marines in the 14th New York belong to Porter's brigade, uh, as does uh, the 38th New York, which, well, which belongs to uh, uh, Heinzelman's division. So you have a mishmash of units up there with nobody literally located with them exercising overall command. Uh, our friend McDowell is sitting back at Dogan's house. So as soon as these guns get moved forward, uh, initially they're fired on. Griff Ricketts guns are fired on first by Confederates, snipers in Henry House, and once he drives them out by firing on that place and killing the owner of the house, Judith Henry, uh, the 33rd Virginia began to fire directly at his own folks as well. Uh, and they also began to uh, take shots at the first Minnesota and, uh, and at the 11th New York, who are there to provide protection and support for the guns. Um, because of the pressure of Confederate artillery and because of the pressure put on the 33rd, the 11th New York and the 1st Minnesota are forced to withdraw. So they're no longer providing protection for the artillery. Also notice Stuart. Stuart is down to the south and Stuart has been told by Jackson to take his overall force of 300 men, send 150 men to the left flank over near Hampton and protect his or right flank and protect his left flank with Stewart's folks. And that's what they do. And they just eat these 11th New York guys up for breakfast. In fact, as Stewart charges this group, he initially thinks it's Confederates. It's not Confederates. Uh, he thought they had zoobs too. So maybe these zoobs are our zoobs. They're not. He eventually recognizes the stars and stripes and literally orders a charge against them. He tears these guys to pieces, but realizes that he can't sustain and takes his force back from whence he came. At this point, now Griffin, who is totally disgusted with his situation, decides that maybe if I take a couple of my guns and I move them to the far right flank, I can fire down the line at the Confederate artillery and force them to abandon their position because uh, I can't just keep my guns uh, to the north of Ricketts and expect to survive. Trouble is when he moves his two guns over there, more Confederates have come up. Now the 49th Virginia that belonged to Cox Brigade has moved up and these units uh, are seen by Griffin's people. Uh, Griffin begins to make efforts to turn his guns on these people. Uh, but again, the chief of artillery rides up and tells him, those are your infantry support. You can't fire at them. Make a long story short, the 49th Virginia and the 33rd Virginia makes short work. And that was the last of us, I think, according to our friend Griffin. And so at that point now, more units have to be brought up to provide protection for those guns up there. This whole battle is gonna obsess on these guns at this point. Now it's the turn of the 14th Brooklyn to move forward. And that's exactly what they do. They move forward, they are able to recapture Griffin's guns. Uh, trouble is uh, their commander does not stop. Uh, once he has achieved uh, uh, capturing the guns. He literally moves forward into Jackson's main line. And what he finds is now his force is surrounded by large numbers of Confederates who then attack him, members of the 27th and the 4th, and these Zouabs, these members of the 14th New York, are now driven from the field. At this point, Griffin's guns are fair game again. And the 6th North Carolina, a new unit that's arrived, again coming forward, uh, seizes those guns. However, they're attacked by elements of the 1st Michigan, as you can see there, uh, and are driven back. So the guns are up for grabs again. Now what happens? Well, we've tried it with the 14th, we've tried it with the 1st, we've tried it with the 11th. Now let's go ahead and use the 5th Massachusetts 
and the 11th Massachusetts. You know, for the first time, it seems like uh, we're actually using two regiments instead of one to try to deal with this problem. Uh, so this is a big failure on the part of Heinzelman as a brigade commander, but he isn't really functioning as a brigade commander anyway, because a large amount of the orders are being given McDow by McDowell back on Dogan Ridge. Uh, these forces will push the fort and they'll push the 27th back. It's in this retreat that Francis Barteau is killed, the commander of one of the Confederate brigades. But no sooner, no sooner does the 11th and the 15th regain control of Ricketts' brigade, uh, but the Confederates will launch another attack, this time from the units that you see at the very end of the arrow. That's, that's the 5th Virginia, part of Jackson's brigade, and also Hampton's legion. They're going to attack the 11th and they're going to attack the 5th. In addition to that, uh, B, who has been sitting back there with all these forces that are sort of milling around, has to get back into things. And so he's going to lead a group of folks from all of those brigades that were milling around that had participated in the action during the morning hours on Matthews Hill uh, in an attack. And he's going to get mortally wounded as well. To make a long story short, the Confederates are able actually to push the 11th and the 5th back across Sudley Road now. By the way, in that last attack, Wade Hampton is wounded, and so command goes to his deputy. And interestingly enough, Beauregard leads the 5th. Beauregard is out there being conspicuous and literally making sure troops get where they need to get and, and inspiring people, what he does best. At this point in time, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. There are only two unengaged units left. Sherman's brigade, which you now see there, uh, just, south, or just south of the Stone House, and up in the left corner, you can see O. Howard's brigade moving forward. Notice that mass is never used against the Confederates during this whole time. And the Confederates, look to your lower right-hand side there, Early, Smith. These are units that are continuing to move up from the other side of the line, units that are not being harassed by the Federals. The red Federals are not holding them in place. The 13th New York attacks on their own. They belong to Sherman. They're beaten back soundly. The 79th New York, the Highlanders, uh, commanded by James Cameron, the brother of the uh, Secretary of War, are th throunced and are sent back literally against this force of Hampton and uh, the 5th of Virginia up there. By the way, uh, James Cameron is mortally wounded uh, in that attack. Then, as a last resort, Sherman will put in the 69th New York, and he'll put in the 38th New York. That's everything. He shot, at, shot his entire charge at that particular point in time, but always just piddling these units, two in at a time, one in at a time. But this force is finally too much for Hampton's Legion in the 5th, and they fall back as indicated by the arrows. But guess what? The Confederates have been continuing to bring forces forward uh, throughout this whole time. Now you see the 8th and the 18th Virginia. These are units that belong to Cox Brigade that were sitting uh, down uh, near uh, uh, Mitchell's Ford. And they're moving forward and they will seize the guns and they will proceed to push the 69th and the 39th away. And also that one remaining Union unit stuck in the wood, the first Michigan there, is pushed out by the uh, 18th Virginia at this time as well. So by 3.30, 3.45 in the afternoon, Henry Hill belongs to the Confederates. They have eight guns total up there, and uh, they've captured eight of the, third, of the uh, 11 guns that were initially there. And now they're forming up along Sudley Road. And Howard begins to move forward. Some argue that he was gonna be used to flank the uh, Confederates. Uh, that's not what others think. Others think that was just simply uh, more troops that McDowell was bringing forward to support the artillery, but that mission is pretty much gone. Uh, these units under Howard form up in fours just like Keyes did earlier. Second Vermont, fourth Maine in the front, third Maine, fifth Maine in the back. And as they move to the top of the hill though, they're facing a large Confederate force now. Literally a force that consists of the 18th and 8th Virginia, the 2nd and the 8th South Carolina, which are from Bonham's Brigade now that have made it forward. Look at Elsie. Elsie was coming up earlier. Now Elsie's 
brigade. Uh, this is the last brigade from Johnston's army has moved forward to Howard uh, to harass Howard. Uh, Jubal Early's unit and the Confederates on the flank. There's also uh, several artillery pieces that literally pound Howard's people on the top of the hill. And uh, Howard's people just simply can't take it anymore. They fall back, back towards Dogan House. And a U.S. regular battalion is brought forward to provide some protection for the withdrawal. So we literally have a situation where the, the entire delay in the afternoon of, of Howard, of, of, excuse me, McDowell, makes it possible for the Confederates to hold on and to ultimately win. The Confederates do a great job of managing the battle. The Confederates, uh, uh, the Federals do a terrible job managing battle. The Confederates don't do a bad job at all. And uh, Johnston and Beauregard uh, quickly adapt and brigade commanders show initiative. Aftermath. So after this is all done, everybody pretty much recrosses Bull Run as they had before at the same fords that they used earlier. Our friend Custer does particularly well in this situation. Uh, he is among the last to leave his, his company, Company G, is among the last to leave the field and uh, provides effective leadership during the rearguard action. Uh, Beauregard uh, tries to order pursuit, but the Confederates are far too confuse themselves to be able to accomplish anything. The Federals will pull back to Centerville, but ultimately uh, they will go back into the defenses of Washington, D.C. So here you look at the overall losses, and I, and I wanna bring one thing to your attention at this point. We're looking at a total loss of around 4,690 people, Union and Confederate combined. That literally palls in comparison to the statistics that we're gonna see later in the war excess of 21,000 at Second Manassas, uh, 35,000 at Seven Days, uh, 30,000 at Chancellorsville, 51,000 at Gettysburg. So this, this, at the time it was fought, it was the largest battle that had ever been fought in U.S. military history. And these numbers were staggering, but ultimately in the war, they would not be staggering. You know, the overall losses for both Mexican and U.S. forces in the Mexican War was 25,000. So what do both realize now? They realize now that this war is not gonna be over very, very quickly. Um, Lincoln realizes that Irvin McDowell is done and by the 29th of July, he's already given George McClellan the reins and basically uh, given him the assignment to be the nation's savior. Uh, problems begin to develop between Beauregard and Johnston and the president, the president shows up on the battlefield in the evening. And uh, these things are just going to continue to fester and they're going to continue to get worse as time goes on. How did our personalities hold up? Well, by and large, our protagonists didn't do very bad. Uh, most of them, all of them for that matter, were able to execute, execute uh, their missions effectively and demonstrate that they were ready to assume more responsibility. Uh, Beauregard and Jackson particularly excelled in managing. It's probably the only time in his life Beauregard ever excelled in managing a battlefield. But this was a battlefield that was perfect for him. He, he could literally gaze upon it all and control it on and use his charisma to control it all. That would not be the case at Shiloh or battles afterwards. Sherman and Burnside, kind of an un, uneven performance in this first battle. Uh, we give hats off to Sherman for showing initiative how to get across uh, Farm Ford, uh, but uh, he doesn't really show very good battle management skills, but you can't blame him. It's his first real engagement in warfare on Henry Hill. Uh, Burnside, he does manage to hold it together. His people are the ones that pretty much fight the battle in the morning on Matthews Hill, but once he pulls them back to re-equip uh, to get additional uh, uh, ammunition, uh, he disappears, he's gone. And as far as Stewart and Custard are concerned, uh, they both function relatively inspirational in combat. And uh, as I said, Custer coolly leads rear guard actions. He's, he literally gets back to Washington. The rest of the army gets back to Washington about six in the morning. Custer and Company G get back to DC at about noon. So before I conclude, let me just say that there are three really, really good books. If you want to know everything there is to know about this battle, these are the ones you need to read. 
uh, by our own John Hennessy, who is the expert on Second Manassas, but wrote an extremely readable and very clear book on the first battle of Manassas. If you want to know every bit of minutia that you can learn about this campaign, you can read no better book than Edward Longacre's The Early Morning of War. It's all there, all the lead up and all the detail, thorough as Ed Longacre always is. And finally, if you want military protect perspective on the employment of troops, uh, principles of war, and uh, strategic and tactical evaluations, Edwin Refuse is a single grand victory is a great book. It's a short read and it is literally a soldier's history. So uh, that concludes uh, what I've got for you all right now. I am going to stop sharing and uh, I will open it up to any questions you may have. I'm just gonna say, if you do have a question, um, please make sure to unmute yourself. Um, I have muted just about everybody here, but uh, we'd hate for you to start asking a question or finish asking a question and be like, why is he not answering my question? Because the reason is everybody's muted, so please do unmute yourself first. And this is the time for that. Must have just buried you. Shirley may have, someone must have a question. Okay, I'll dive in. Uh, Peter Vassilopoulos. Uh, uh, recently I've been doing reading about the, the reconnaissance in force that occurred, I believe, uh, at Centerville the day before. Black Prince Board. Yeah, what, what can you say in light of new research or whatever how imp what it was the impact that had on the Union troops because they did suffer a, a, albeit a small minor defeat what what did that really impact that it have on McDowell well I would say just based on my judgment and, and what I've read that uh, the impact overall on the Union forces was not all that great uh, this was Israel Richardson's division or brigade of uh, Tyler's division uh, that brigade did not participate in the offensive operation uh, that was launched on the 21st. Uh, it, was, it was rough on their morale, but I'm not sure they really had the opportunity or the location to uh, poison the morale of the balance of the division of Tyler. Uh, as I said during the talk, I think that the relationship between Tyler and and McDowell, which was strained at the very beginning, was well past strained by the time that uh, the battle began. And so when you see a situation where McDowell takes off with the flanking force and he's over on the other side of Bull Run, um, you don't see Tyler doing much more than exactly what he's being asked to do. And even when he does show initiative, as I pointed out to you all, um, with Key's brigade, and, and there was a tremendous opportunity there, literally, to flank the Confederates. Uh, they just didn't realize what they had in front of them. Most of the reinforcements were not up by that point, could have easily overwhelmed the Confederates. Even if he had put in all four instead of just two regiments, uh, he would have been able to inform them. Uh, Tyler was making no effort whatsoever to inform McDowell about anything he was doing, nor did he seem to have any interest at all in any, anything else happening on the battlefield. So when you go into a fight like that uh, with a senior and a subordinate that are not communicating well and are dealing with personal issues. I got a question, uh, Mark. Uh, yeah. About um, the, the retreat. Clearly during the, uh, the battle, they, uh, there were some issues with uh, using the units piecemeal. Was McDowell able to get anybody back together and, and do an orderly type of retreat? I've heard that it was pretty much of a, of a route. Was that true as, as they went back to DC? Well, there were times, uh, there were times when, the, when the, uh, the retreat was chaotic and there were times when it was not chaotic. Uh, the Confederates to a large degree were disorganized themselves. Um, but I, I would say elements of both were certainly present. And once they got back inside of the defenses at, at Centerville, then they, they continued the retreat, but it was at a much more 
leisurely rate and people were, they weren't even with their units anymore. A lot of units, you know, they, they literally, the units reformed once they got back to Washington, DC. People were just, but were just retreating. But, you know, a lot of guys, I, I remember reading a statement by someone said it was like a, like a shopkeeper who decided that, you know, it was a bad business day and I'll just shut the door and go home. And so there wasn't that chaos. Now, when the cavalry hit you or when artillery pounded you, which the Confederates were able to do to some degree during the retreat, uh, some of that chaos was there. But the Confederates themselves were, were, were no less, uh, no less uh, I think, uh, confused after this was all over uh, than the Federals were. Okay, thank you. I might add, just because I didn't mention it during the talk, that McDowell would send orders back to Dixon Miles at the beginning of the retreat or just before the retreat to bring units down the Warrenton Turnpike to provide protection for the army as it withdrew. Problem was Dixon Miles was drunk at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. And when he was exercising any kind of control over around Blackburn's mm -hmm. Ford, it didn't make any sense and people were ignoring him. And the room went silent. I, I, I guess I just destroyed you all. What happened to McDowell after, right after that? Where did, he, where did he go? He will end up receiving core level command and will end up ultimately uh, in the army that falls under um, John Pope. But his first, you know, literally within days of McClellan arriving, uh, he's dropped down to core level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this uh, I, is Paul. Go ahead. Uh, so I came a little bit late into the talk, and I'm sure you addressed it. But at the beginning of the battle, McDowell's army is known as the Army of Northeastern Virginia, and Beauregard's army is the Army of the Potomac. Right. Um, about what time frame did they, the, the titles of the two armies essentially switch? Well, of course, McClellan is the one, you know, he, he takes charge on the 29th of July, and I'm not sure of the exact date where he declares the Army of the Potomac, but it is shortly thereafter. As far as the Army of the Potomac, I think that that terminology disappears with Beauregard and, and, and maybe with the withdrawal of those forces uh, down to face McClellan on the peninsula, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the Army was called at that point. Uh, we know that it was called the Army of Northern Virginia when Lee took over, so you, you have that period when it was the Army of the Potomac. Uh, once the Army of the Potomac had been declared, obviously that's not what this army could be. And so uh, shortly thereafter, for lack of a better answer. Thank you. You know, one of the authors that I read in preparing for this talk had said that, um, they were saying that Sherman was never a particularly good tactician. If you read the Refuse book, uh, you see that. And, and he's, his argument in that book is that, you know, the poor employment that you see on a tactical level on Henry Hill by Sherman, uh, he never gets better. Uh, they talk about Chickasaw Bluffs at, uh, during the Vicksburg campaign where, you know, he just, he can think great on an operational or strategic level, but as far as tactical employment, he just, it was certainly not his forte. And I think Jackson was Jackson was totally solid on that day. That that brigade, that you know, considering the lack of experience, um, that brigade performed superbly on that day. I think this is where we do the raffle. <laughs> I think I think that wraps it up. Thank you, Mario. It was a pretty broad, uh, broad look at, and then thank you so much. Um, Sorry to go a little long, but it's it's it's. You can't leave it. You can't leave it in the middle of the afternoon. You got to kind of finish it up. You know, you have to get through. Well, it it is, and I, you know, one of the things I said at the beginning too is that I, I know how it is for other people, but for me, 
uh, this was always a battle that I rushed past. You know, I just got the essential stuff and then I moved on to things that were more interesting to me, it seems like. But yet there are things you see here that you know are gonna get addressed and corrected as the years go on. And then you see things here that people just never seem to figure out and, and they never seem to, to correct. Um, uh, I am amazed at literally the, uh, the brigade commanders uh, for Beauregard and Johnston's army and, and how they handle initiative in this situation. And they're pretty much aware of what's going on with each other and they're able to manage themselves. You know, Lee always said, I try to get people uh, within, uh, you know, the battlefield realm, and then I let my subordinate commanders handle it. Um, they certainly did a great job there uh, in a situation where they didn't really have any more experience moving large bodies of troops around than, uh, than their federal counterparts. You know, something else, too, it just occurred to me, is they also weren't struggling with the threat of the 90-day um, departures, which was a big oh, yeah. thing for Patterson, but it was a big thing for McDowell, too. A lot of those troops went home after this. And so, you know, they're getting pushed. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, at the risk of, it uh, doesn't have to be a, a long answer. Um, at this stage of the war, most of these militia units, a lot of them are, are using um, smoothbore, buck and ball rounds. What impact would you say that that would have had this early in the war? And, uh, you know, you talked about the, uh, the comparatively low casualties in this battle. Would you see that as a cause down the road when more rifles are now being introduced into the armaments of the next wave of soldiers coming in. Have you come across any research on that? Well, you know, I, I've, I've come across theorizing by historians or statements by historians, and I, I definitely agree with, with what I've read. And one of the things you read about this fight, and this is just by reading accounts of soldiers themselves, that, you know, they were not aiming at what they were hitting at. I mean, admittedly, a buck and ball does not have the range of, a, of, a, of an infield or a 58 caliber Springfield. Uh, but some of these guys were aiming way the hell too high. And so a lot of shots went, you know, wild. And so I think that was a big factor in, in low casualties here. Uh, I think, yeah, you have a larger percentage of, I don't know the numbers, but you have a larger percentage of smoothbore rifles on this field than you have rifled muskets. And that obviously changes during the, the years of the war. And so, yeah, that's going to have an impact too. Um, and also, I think too, uh, artillery. Uh, I, I can't emphasize enough that for the federal artillery to do what the federal artillery did in the early part of this fight, uh, they could easily hit the Confederate targets. They could easily hit the Confederate positions from the distance they had. And the Confederates couldn't touch him over there on Dogan Ridge. They, they couldn't touch him. And once those guns were moved to Henry Hill, they were within 250 and 300 yards of Jackson's line. And they had the crap blown out of them by Confederate artillery, which are now totally in range. Uh, so, you know, maybe artillery is responsible for a, a larger percentage of deaths here in this conflict or injuries in this conflict. Uh, than other battles, but I think your your point about the buck and ball is well taken, and but I also think that there were a heck of a lot more troops that were missing what they were shooting at here uh, than certainly there were uh, when the Confederates lined up at the Stonewall Fredericksburg or lined up at Cold Harbor in '64. All right. I think I think uh, that'll do it, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate it. I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, this was fun for me, and I hope it was fun for you. <laughs>